Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Moderately? I feel like people are a little tired. Yes? Hi? Maybe? Okay, how do we want to... There's a lot of us. <laughs> okay, really? I'm not going to... No. Okay, give me one second to get myself slightly organized here. All right, welcome, everybody. So... Um, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you live in South Florida? Okay, awesome. And show of hands, how many of you are visiting? Oh, actually very few. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so for those of us who live here, um, as well as for the benefit of those who are, who are visiting, we know South Florida is a really interesting nexus point between the hemisphere, right? We have the potential to be the Alexandria of this hemisphere to a certain degree. And so the connection point that we can have from Latin America and North America is a very frequent point of discussion. What, what I do think often happens, and we as CIC engage very robustly with Latin American partners, Colombia being one of the main countries that we engage with, and, and we've had an incredible experience doing so, what we keep noticing is that there's not enough, there's always this idea that we as, the, as Miami, as a nexus point and an entry to the U.S., should be a point of entrance to this market and should be a point of kind of access to the U.S. We don't so much, however, fully utilize and realize how many incredible things are happening in the region, how many really transformative and fantastic ideas are taking place in the public sector, the private sector, in countries like Colombia that are so close to us and that are really propelling and investing in entrepreneurship and in innovation and in scientific research, as well as public policy. So I'm very excited to be working, um, not working, well, both to be working with them, but also to be engaging in this panel and to feature some of those perspectives here today. And so, sorry to be weirdly removing my paperwork, just deal with me here for a second. Okay, so we're excited to welcome this panel. Sorry for the multiple paperwork. So I'll let everybody kind of briefly introduce themselves, and then I'll start a little bit with our conversation, and then if there are questions from the audience, we'll let a little bit of a room for that. So our topic today is looking at Colombia as a hub of entrepreneurship, tech innovation, and the future of the orange economy. Our panelists here today, and I'll ask them to kind of raise their hand because I've written them in a different order, but Diego Paramo Atalaya, okay, who's executive vice president of Poder.io, Maria Escobar, who's the owner, producer, and writer of La Mar, Santiago Perez Cardona, who's the co-founder, executive director of InMotion Group, and Esteban Ochoa, co-founder and CTO of Eventia. Is that how you pronounce that? Okay, excellent. Um, so Esteban, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do, your own trajectory? Don't take too long so that we don't have to inform questions, but tell us a little bit about what you do, your background, and what your company does. Sure. Uh, so I'm um, CTO and co-founder of Eventia, and uh, basically what we do is make these kind of events happen. Um, I don't know if you knew, but uh, being an event organizer is uh, the fourth most stressful job on the planet. The main reason, and, uh, or one of the main reasons, is that uh, when organizing these events, you need a lot of tools and platforms to organize the event. You need a website, you need a registration platform, among a lot of different elements. And most of the time, you need to integrate all of that by hand, which becomes really stressful and uh, add a lot of, uh, add a lot of uh, extra expenses to the event in terms of time and uh, a lot of sleepless nights as well. So what we do is provide the event organizer with all of the tools they need into one beautiful and easy to use event management platform they can use so that they can devote, devote their time to add value and not manual tasks. That's what we do. Awesome, thank you. I'm Maria Escobar from La Mar Media. We create and develop content for kids, but not common content. We like to create diverse and unique content so we can show kids that heroes can come in every size and every shape. We understood that most of the content that children consume all over the world is not created in their region. So we want kids to see how other kids live in other parts of the world. We produce 2D and 3D content, and the income comes from licensing JIPs to brands for merchandising. Um, hi, my name is Diego Paramo. I'm co-founder and executive vice president of Epica. Epica is an artificial intelligence company 
basically what we are doing is um, we take uh, data from different sorts of companies, we process it with the AI and start doing predictions. Uh, mainly we are working with um, retailers, telcos, um, a, lot of, a lot of companies not only in the United States but also in Colombia, Mexico, Europe um, and, and we've been already for the marketing more or less two and a half years so we're basically an AI company. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Santiago Perez, uh, CEO and co-founder of InMotion Group. Um, we are a company builder, essentially. We build technology portfolios for mobility uh, to transport people on cargo. Uh, we mainly create technology for electric vehicles, so from a sensor, from a single chip, to a complete vehicle. Uh, batteries, motors, software, hardware. Uh, and uh, we've been working on like seven years now, I think. Uh, most of those, uh, four of them, the first four were we, the four co-founders, uh, in our lab, like creating the technologies, the assets we were going to build on later on. Uh, we have been last three years in market. Uh, we have a portfolio of electric bikes, charging stations, uh, automated corporate mobility systems, and some other softwares we rely on. Uh, since we're a company builder, we create other companies that depend on our technologies. Uh, so in Motion Group uh, gets equity or revenues from the royalties of those other companies. Uh, currently, we have four companies uh, operating out of our technology. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'll ask a follow-up question that's for the whole panel. Um, and Santiago, we can start with you and work our way this way. We hear a lot about, and, and I've had the privilege of engaging directly with some entities in Colombia, um, we hear a lot about the growth of the entrepreneurial sector in Colombia, both in relation to the private sector and the role that the government has played in that. Kind of, it's a thriving market in a lot of different ways and there's interesting data to support that, especially in the context of the region. So what has been your trajectory or how has that influenced the trajectory of the growth, the establishment of the growth of your company and how, and walk us a little bit through your positioning into a kind of regional or a global platform. So what, has that helped you? Has that just been neutral? Kind of what has been the growth in terms of your company grown and started in Colombia? What's the effect of, of the general ecosystem there on that? And how has that supported your trajectory into a different regional or global footprint? Well, um, for us in Medellin, which is our city, um, I think we have a very carefully crafted uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem because uh, when we started uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, we had a small idea which was to solve our own mobility issues. Uh, we wanted to create vehicles for ourselves. Uh, and with that small idea, uh, we went to the smallest con contest, um, like a municipal contest available. Um, we received the feedback and the training for the small steps we were taking at that time. And from there to now, we've been in, I think, 10 or 11 uh, incubation processes with different uh, companies, initiatives, government uh, establishments. and. Uh, what I feel is that, I, I, and I was saying is carefully crafted, is because we have been taken from there, from the smallest idea we had to this scenario, like to start thinking global. Uh, we have been now exposed to global markets, to other VCs, to global investors, uh, to global initiatives, and uh, it has taken us literally by surprise, like the growth we have been, we have been exposed to. Uh, so basically I think that when, when you carefully craft an ecosystem to embrace an entrepreneur, uh, you can, as an entrepreneur, uh, be delivering your full potential to your system and to your country. Uh, and then uh, take institutions as for Colombia, uh, that empower your knowledge and what you're doing uh, and really be grateful with them because, because I think those steps are getting bigger and bigger and at a pace that uh, you would not imagine when you were starting. So, so I, would, I would take those words and uh, maybe, maybe I think those answer your, your question is, I think, I think uh, 
we are not Silicon Valley in Medellin because we, we, we don't uh, tend to create those big ideas at the beginning. We are starting to do it right now because of the globalization and the exponential growth. But years back, uh, it, it took us uh, a lot of processes to, to, to be here. So, so I, think, I think that's the way we've done it. For us, it has been um, interesting thinking about Colombia, not, on, not only as a, a hub to actually expand the company. Um, you talked a little bit about, about Miami. We are also local here in Miami, and we have uh, co the company here. Um, and, and we do see not only Miami, but also Colombia as a gateway to, to access different types of organizations. Um, just, just to put you in context, for example, we started uh, with Unilever in Colombia. Um, after, after a while, then we started with Middle Americas in, 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 and working all Middle America with uh, Unilever and then actually we're now taking conversations globally. So um, Colombia has, has actually helped us to be part of, of big organizations. You know, the, the, the Colombian people have been very open to um, exploring new things like AI, and, and that is and that is one thing, right? The other thing is um, having partners like ProColombia that can help you be in this type of, of, of events and so on. Definitely gives you um, a, an opportunity to to take your 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 startup to a next level, right? Not only because we are seeking right now investing, but also um, definitely clients, right? And the third one is, in terms of government, um, I, I guess there's, there's a lot of things still to be done, right? I think that our president right now is doing a lot of, uh, of th things to, to help the, the startup ecosystem and it's going to work. Uh, maybe next year we're going to see a, lo a lot of that uh, actually taken into account. Um, but we still, to, we, we still need as a country to, to develop, right? And last but not, but not least, at, at least for, for us, is that um, in terms of, of talent, um, it's very difficult to find talent that actually knows how to program artificial intelligence, right? And it's not only, not only in Latin America, actually here in the, in the States and, and in Europe it's difficult to find. So um, in terms of, of, of um, skills and, and knowledge of those, of those people, I guess, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done in Colombia, right? Definitely not only worldwide, but also in Colombia. But I definitely see Colombia as a, as a, as a good platform to not only uh, start a company, but also to expand it, you know? We've got our first unicorn already that is Rappi, and that's a good way to, to see how uh, Colombian entrepreneurs are thinking globally, right? So I, I, I see it as a, as a good gateway, not only to Latin America, but also worldwide. In our case, the support of the Colombian government is being very significant because we have been able to visit other markets and to understand good practices of the business in other markets. So that can help us to improve the quality of our products. In children's entertainment, you need to think globally. And with this support, we have been able to think in other cultures and in other environments to tell stories for kids. In our case, uh, the, the first thing I will mention is that uh, some years ago, uh, the situation in Colombia was completely different uh, to what it's today uh, because of terms of security and a lot of other stuff. So uh, right now, the government has the, the means and uh, the objective to definitely promote uh, this kind of uh, industry and uh, entrepreneurship in the country. Uh, and that has been a, a lot of help for, for everyone, I think. It's, it's easier than, than ever now to start something in Colombia, mostly because you have uh, entities that, that are going to help you. Uh, ProColombia, for instance, has been a lot of help for us. Um, when we started uh, initially, we created the product for, for Colombia, but uh, immediately we saw that uh, it had the potential of going globally. And that's when these kind of entities can really help you a lot. Uh, you can see now that there's a lot, a lot of investments in the area. You can see that companies are moving there and uh, that's creating a, an, an interesting, um, I will say, problem for us because uh, now that U.S. companies or yeah, European companies are moving to Colombia to, doing, uh, to do offshore development, um, the cost of labor, at least for software developers, is going really high. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to compete with that. 
but there's always some ways to, to do it. So that, that's becoming a challenge. Uh, but at the same time, it's an opportunity because uh, that means that the quality of the people you can hire there is getting better all the time. So it's been an interesting challenge and uh, I only think it's going to improve because right now all of the airports are heading towards that direction. You talked, you talked a bit about um, kind of cost of labor. Um, you talked a bit about talent. Uh, you mentioned security. So I'm curious, and this is kind of for whoever wants to take in on the panel, what are other trends that you're noticing that kind of both within the Colombian ecosystem and in Latin America as a whole, they can be different, but that you think are interesting for a U.S. market to pay attention to? And then we have a room of investors, entrepreneurs, academics. So kind of what are, what are particular trends that you think are worth paying attention to in the region and in Colombia specifically? There's, I will always say, I mean, the U.S., it's a really advanced economy. Uh, Latin America is behind, obviously. But that brings a lot of, uh, I will say, opportunities. Take a look, for instance, uh, the blockchain. The blockchain, it's, it's a technology that uh, obviously is not quite there, but it's going to allow of, uh, uh, a lot of countries to leapfrog uh, technologies that they don't have. Uh, and and that, there's a lot of opportunities in Colombia or Latin America uh, to do that, for instance. And today, uh, I mean, this is something that, uh, that uh, has impressed me a lot. Uh, and it's that a uh, few years ago, you wouldn't see uh, foreign people in the country. I mean, it was like, oh, wow, I saw someone there. Today, you see a lot of people there, not only traveling, but also people going there to create their startups and uh, to create their companies. Uh, so that, that definitely means something. And um, you also see a lot of people, well, not a lot, but uh, you, you see some cases of people uh, that are moving uh, business cases or uh, business uh, opportunity, like uh, moving one company from the US, the, the, the business model, copying the business model and doing that in Colombia. And that's been quite successful as well. Um, I guess, seeing from an entrepreneurial point of view, you need to think globally, but at, act locally. In, in our case, we are only 40, 42 people, right? But um, we're almost in six countries. So we have never thought about creating a company that everyone needs to be in the same place in order to work. And, and that is a good idea because um, and it has worked because what we do or what we see in Latin America is an, an, an immense talent, immense talent for certain things, right? Not, not necessarily for everything, but and, and the cost of labor is, is definitely cheaper than in other places, right? If you compare um, hiring high, high executives, for example, in the U.S., or they're going to be more costly than doing it in, 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 in Colombia or on, on other places in the, in the Latin American market. So definitely if, if you start thinking more globally, right, and, and, and in terms of expanding, maybe you can see um, customer success representatives attending from Colombia the U.S. market, right, or maybe having uh, people that are not necessarily that need to uh, engage in face-to-face -face conversations, right, from other markets that definitely can are in your same time zone, that have good English, that can work and so on. So, so I see a good trend in terms of, of how to actually um, see uh, seek people talent um, that are in a in a, well, a good a good level of talent, but um, definitely has a, a, a very good cost efficiency in terms of, of the whole the whole ecosystem. So I guess those are like the two main things that I would that I would add. Um, I would frame for a second the partition we have in the world in terms of business models and the equity. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, nine people in the world have the equivalent of resources than the half of the poorest uh, population in the world. And uh, talking about trends, uh, and the globalization, what we see in our country and in some other countries in the world is that the, this gap is closing. So there's a lot of people working on uh, creating apps, technology services for this other half, which is a bunch of people. It's a huge market for any opportunity we can embrace on. Um, so I would say that's a very important trend to pay attention to is there's not only 
the rich part of the world and the wealthy part of the world, yeah, there's a huge economy waiting for new business models to be deployed. So uh, I would take it just, just that way. It's just, we can start from US designing for other markets which are not natural, and we can start for the, from those markets to create for those same markets. We are like always, we always tend to be looking at the outside part of the market because we are not used to understand that our markets by themselves are very rich in opportunities. Uh, so that's the trend and the insights we are ha we having a look at. That's, um, I think that's an interesting point that often doesn't get included in these conversations. So um, thank you for bringing that up. I think you're right. On the topic, um, kind of moving a little bit to the, the title of our panel is about the orange economy. And um, there are certain trends and research topics that that implies um, as kind of global institutions look into it. And one of the things that I think is, is unquestionable and, and reverberates across all of our industries is this idea of the intersection of the analog and the digital realms, increasingly so. And this is true for our entrepreneurs, our startups, it's true for our cities, our urban planners, our government. And so from that perspective, what have you seen kind of, first of all, how does this affect your industry? And secondly, what have you seen recently that has been really inspiring or thought provoking or kind of left you intrigued around that intersection? In our case, it is a priority for us to understand and other platforms to tell stories we became in television, but now we feel that we have to bridge the, the platforms. We would need to, to connect the TV content to other platforms. So we need to migrate to understand how kids consume content now. So at the beginning, we produced just shows, but now we, we need to produce apps, digital platforms, toys, so we need to understand how kids consume content now in a different way. Um, for us, it's, it, it has been interesting because we have been working with creative industries a lot. Um, and, and the merger between the creative and artificial intelligence is going to be amazing, right? Not only because you're going to be capable of generating new sorts of communication, right? Um, but also because technology has now become the, the gateway to actually invent new things, right? So um, part of, of what I see in terms of the orange economy is definitely artificial intelligence is going to be a key driver. Um, and not only because we have generated new platforms for them to use as creative industry, but also because the, the, the velocity and the way the creative thinking is changing is, is exponential. So, um, for example, you take now and, and, and you can go from an idea to the actual execution in 60 days, 30 days, 40 days, right? With AI and, and the merger between creative and, 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 and automation, uh, automation, you can maybe cut that in half, or maybe have a complete set of, of creatives in less than, I don't know, two hours or so. So uh, the dynamics in terms of creative um, industries is gonna change dramatically. And we're gonna see it in the next three or four years, the velocity and the, and the change, and the game changers are gonna be there, showing us in terms of how creative, um, the whole creative ecosystem is gonna be applying new technologies, right? And, and that is one of the key things that we need to address in terms of technology, um, creative thinking, um, and, and, and the orange economy by itself, right? So, so I, I definitely see that um, there's a high potential. The, the fact is who is ready to actually embrace that change, right? Because you can continue inside all the orange economy doing things as you have done it uh, for the past 10, 20, 30 years. And that's going to change. So maybe that's that's. I guess that that is um, a, a huge call for the companies that are in that economy to actually seek new technologies that are going to make them faster and more intelligent. Right. So I see it like that. 
Um, I, we, we see an interesting point in the so-called uh, uberization of the business models and the society. Uh, and talking about this gap, we need to, we need to create a bridge of uh, where the analog things and the digital things are located. Um, it's wonderful for me to think of how can you find spots in the market of things that are not, that are not solved where you can offer the key stakeholders some opportunities that, for example, in, in, the, in the case of Rappi, which is the app uh, you were mentioning before, uh, bridges people with a very analog necessity, which is to transport or to buy something with uh, the other end, which is somebody that needs it. Uh, and the bridge is so interesting when it closes the way Rapid closed it because it offers the, the people that are working in these kind of models like Uber or, or this app, or this app uh, minimum wages that are higher than the average in the country they are operating in. Uh, so taking that question into another perspective, uh, that's very interesting for me to, to imagine. And, uh, and I'm wondering every day of my life, where's the next spot? Where can I, where can I apply your knowledge? to create a new opportunity like that, uh, because I think that really adds value and that transforms a society. And that's very interesting of the, of the current government we have. Um, because with those kind of closures in the, in the bridges in the society, we can really raise the level uh, and the economy of a country and the quality of life for people. For us, uh, analog uh, and digital has been a, a key element Mostly because uh, I guess we've been driven by creativity uh, all the times, in the sense that uh, we're all the time hearing problems that our, our users have uh, when organizing their events. Uh, and we try to come up with cre creative solutions uh, that wouldn't be here uh, if we didn't have the digital element. I mean, uh, so so it, it's been, and by digital I mean, for instance, the, the, just, just take the, the um, cloud computing. Without that, um, a lot of what we do wouldn't be possible today, wouldn't be possible for a lot of different entrepreneurs that are trying to do something today. So uh, it, it is really obvious that, that uh, the, the digital comes after the analog, uh, and I guess that's happening in, in, uh, across all of the industries. Everything is moving so fast now. Uh, and ju just one thing, I mean, uh, if we wanted to hear a song that uh, you wanted a couple of years back, you'll have to wait on the radio station until they put that song. Now it's just like a look it out on a Spotify and, and that's it. You have it immediately. The same goes with, with technology. You just need to launch a new server. You have an idea. Just sign up for Amazon and uh, in one hour, one hour and a half, you have that. Before it was just impossible. Uh, and the best thing is that uh, when you're in, uh, the best thing is that uh, the, the, these changes are affecting us all. I mean, we all can take advantage of that, which is great. It's not that uh, just a certain part of the world can access that. It, it's all of us. So that, that, that's been a key element for us, being able to, to make the switch from uh, analog to digital, to be able to, to, to grasp and uh, to, take a, to, to be able to access all of these technologies has been a key player for us. Thank you. Um, kind of a bit of a curious question, but needless to say, each region in the world is different. And with each, each, within those regions, each country is unique both because of their culture, their economy, their government. So when I, when I look at Latin America, I see a conglomerate of very different type of countries with some things in common and some things not. So when we look at, at kind of the, the, the movement and the wave of the orange economy as a driver, since there's such a, such a big implication around the creative, the creative economy and the creative class, I'm curious what role does culture and cultural heritage play in its development? And how are you seeing that in Colombia or in Latin America? Well, it's huge, sorry, it's huge. Because as we see it through all the region, not only the way you talk, you know, in terms of uh, marketing, sales, whatever, it impacts the way you actually um, create, right? So that is part of the complexity of the orange economy in Latin America, right? Because most of the, of, the, of the creatives need to be tailored for each specific country because of the way we talk, 
right? It's different the way in Mexico t talk and, and refer to specific things than what Argentina, or Brazil, or Colombia, or whatever, right? So it, it, it generates a lot of complexity in terms of the whole region when you are creating and, and, and part of the creative industry. Now, the other thing is that that is easily, that, that's an, you can easily automate that. You know, so maybe you have a, a creative, you, you're part of the creative industry or you're doing something in terms of creation and then you can automate everything to be specific for each of the countries, right? But one of the things that I really see is first that, that complexity in terms of the ways that we talk, the way that we refer to things and so on. And, and second is, as a wave of orange economy, um, all the countries are very creative. You know, there, there's a good uh, generation of, crea of, of creativity, of, of um, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of people are actually inside this economy. And that's, and that's really cool. Um, in Colombia, I, I don't remember the, 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 the amount of the percentage of, of, the, of the total economy, but it's like, I don't know, 20% or so. So it's, it's a huge economy, and if you actually um, tailor specific things that may work for that orange economy, well, you're definitely um, going to hit the nail in a, in a specific niche that is really interesting. So I see it as, a, as an upcoming... Um, process in terms of how you can generate value from the orange economy, you know? That's, that's how I see it. We used to export goods before, like coffee, fruit, and oil, and now we are exporting talent and creativity, innovation, and also storytelling. So it is new for our country, and the entertainment industry is in development, but we have such a richness there that we are ready for investment in those sectors now. Um, we also have this special flavor and this special spirit in how we tell stories that make us unique. So in entertainment specifically, we have this good storytelling heritage from literature, from cinema, movies, and everything, and we have this flavor that it's very Colombian. As you said, we are different in Latin America, but we also have some similitudes. And so, similarities. Yes, yeah, similarities. So we still are unique, but we are Latins. I guess one important thing is that uh, in Latin America, you will find that uh, and uh, when you talk to someone that it's not from uh, Latin America, they will mostly say that people are really warm there. And I guess warmth equals service. And uh, when you mix those two things, uh, you get creativity. And uh, when you get creativity, then you can solve any kind of problems. And if on top of that you put technology, then you will see a new, uh, a new era of solutions coming from Latin America to serve the world in a lot of different problems that we have today. Uh, just a brief thing, I would say certainly in Latin America, this warmness of the people uh, is very useful when you want to do X as a service. Because whatever you want to do as a service and get in touch with the customer uh, will need that warmness we have and that will be uh, impacting positively what you decide to do uh, with the business model. So we have a couple of minutes left. In kind of, if I may trouble each of you in, in a sentence or two, so kind of just brief and off the cuff, where do you see your company in five years? Uh, in our case, uh, since we are transforming into a company builder with, with, with these new uh, stages of, the, of, our, uh, of our company, we are projecting a 25x growth uh, with at least eight divisions more from now on uh, to five years. So a huge reach and a global reach uh, for our team, or for our technologies. For us, uh, we're definitely aiming global with what we're doing. And uh, from Colombia, it's been an, a really nice place to, to do it. Um, 
And uh, but one of the main elements that uh, we're doing there, it's uh, definitely, uh, I will say, evangelizing how to organize events better through technology. So because there's nothing there, uh, there's nothing. Uh, so we definitely see ourselves um, as leaders in the region, but at the same time as a really strong competitors here in the U.S. and Europe. I mean, obviously, I would like to to say, hey, we want to be like uh, the leader here, but um, competition is hard, and uh, obviously, to beat them, you need to work really hard, and uh, that's basically what we're doing. But um, in Latin America, there are a lot of bridging opportunities that you can take advantage of. Sometimes it's, it's a little bit harder because you have to to evangelize people uh, in some sense, but uh, again, that opens a lot of opportunities. So one, one of the areas uh, where we see in five years is being in leaders uh, in even technology management for Latin America. In our case, we have had so much success in Latin America because our shows has been aired in channels as Discovery Kids and Netflix that we think we are ready to co-produce with U.S. and Canadian companies to bring our content globally. We want our shows to be bilingual and to have like these transmedia strategies so we can have the TV show and the apps and the website and the toys. So what we really want is to reach the global market with these unique stories that we create in Latin America and to tell kids how kids live in Latin America, but telling them universal stories. For us, um, I think in five years we're going to be already global, meaning that um, we have already started operations in, in Asia. So we currently have operations in, in all America and, 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 and some parts of Europe, so the, 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 low, the ideal thing is to finish at least this in the next three years or so and then go, go to Asia. And um, definitely we see, the, the cool thing about the, the, the area that we're working on is that um, AI is exponential, meaning that it's, it's amazing to see what the machines are doing right now. If we go back two and a half years, we never thought about the possibility of what our machines are doing right now. So thinking about what they will be doing maybe in five years is amazing, you know? Actually, sometimes we cannot grasp the whole idea of what's going on, right? But um, definitely global footprint, maybe having um, content being created by AI from scratch, um, where you can basically tell a, an AI what you want to create and it's gonna be created by them, right? Maybe we already have bots, uh, conversational bots. Maybe in five years we'll be talking to one of our bots and you do not know that it's not human, right? So it's like those are the, th the sort of things that are going to happen in the next five years and definitely we will be there doing that, okay? Wonderful. Well, thank you to all four of you um, for telling us about your own goals and your own objectives and for sharing a bit of context on where Colombia has been, where it is, and where the region is going. I'm sure this audience in particular being in Miami is appreciative and interested as a neighbor. So thank you and good luck. No, thank you. Thank Thanks you. you.